But I think that's something that is that is easily missed, is the central bank's uh, intrusion into the markets and their support for the stock and bond markets. And you know that they're buying a certain amount of gold, but they're certainly not supporting those markets. Um, but they are buying gold. And at some point, they may choose to put much more support into the gold markets and take it out of the stock market. But then the question you have to ask is, who buys all the stocks that the central banks are selling? Are you tired of overpaying for your gold, silver, and platinum bullion coins and bars? Then visit sdbullion.com today. SD Bullion was recently named the 177th fastest growing company in the United States by Inc. Magazine. This is because they offer the absolute lowest prices in the industry and follow up with over the top customer service. So what are you waiting for? Go to sdbullion.com today. Enjoy more than 60,000 happy investors that save money on every precious metals purchase they make. everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com. With us today is Gary Christensen from DeviantInvestor.com. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, good morning and thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. I was uh, reading a couple of your recent articles about uh, precious metals. Now, you recently were reporting on you know, how precious metals are really uh, depressed in this point in time. What do you think is the cause of this? Well, I think there are multiple causes. I think that uh, nobody cares about silver and gold anymore because the stock market's been going up since 2009. And to the extent they care about it, they think, well, why should I buy silver and gold? It's going nowhere. Let's buy Bitcoin or some cryptocurrency. So I really think that the, pub pop, the, the public has been um, disconnected from the reality of, of real money, gold and silver. And everybody's obsessed with uh, uh, the stock market and the bond market. Um, there's just no interest out there. And so premiums on coins aren't relative, aren't very high. Uh, they aren't selling well. Uh, there's, there's a normal industry. But the real kicker for most prices is going to be investor demand. And that's not there right now. It's maybe going to start, but it's just not there. So we have prices quite low. Now, what is your perspective on the sentiment uh, and investor demand for gold versus silver? Is there any difference there? Well, um, at this point, the gold-silver ratio is something in the neighborhood of 85. And uh, that's important because that tells you a couple things. If you go back and look at um, 50, 60 years of history, you'll see that whenever that ratio is high, being like 70 to 80, and the, the highest it's been in history is around 100. So we're, we're near uh, the highest in history, and we're one of the high, five highest or so in, in, in history right now. Every time the ratio has gotten that high, it tells you two things. Gold prices are low and silver prices are even lower because when the ratio goes high, that tells you that silver prices are low. And that only happens when we've been in a prolonged period of, of crashing prices. And if you go back and look at those times when the, the ratio was high, you'll find that every one of them was within a few days to a few months, a very good time to be paying silver based on what happened in the next few years. No, so right now what you're saying is that uh, silver is even more depressed than gold. Why do you think that is? Well, again, it's who cares about silver. Um, never mind the the manipulation aspect of it. But people are, you know, people. Would you rather put your money in silver or would you rather put your money in Amazon stock? Everybody knows about Amazon stock. Everybody thinks about Facebook. Everybody thinks about Apple. Everybody thinks about the Dow Jones. That's where the 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 focus is. If you look at graphs of sentiment for silver, um, you'll see that it's at near or at all-time lows uh, measured by the daily sentiment index. People just don't care, um, and frankly, they're worn out. You know, they, they say that the silver market will either wear you out or, or destroy you. Um, people are worn out. They peak was in 2011. I started looking for a major rally in 2013-14, certainly by 2015, and it hasn't happened. And, you know, I happen to think I know a lot about silver, 
but if you don't really see the investment basis for it in the big picture, then you say, well, why should I focus on that? Let's go buy Amazon stock. Or let's go buy Facebook. Look at that. It's doubled. So there's really no sentiment. There's really no interest in um, in the precious metals right now. And the I believe that cryptocurrencies took billions of dollars out of the potential gold and silver market, as well as other markets. And that's just one more factor that keeps prices suppressed. There's just not enough interest to buy them. That will change, but I just can't give you a date. No, yeah, I mean, it definitely, it seems like it, uh, the, it can all just go on a lot longer than a lot of people expect, you know? Um, but what is your perspective on like what people should be doing now? I know we can't give financial advice on this channel, but, um, should people be, you know, playing around in in the stock market? I mean, that's what seems to be working. You know, that's what has been working for the last a couple of years, the stock market has just kept going up uh, and precious metals have, have stayed the same or gone lower. So what should people be doing right now? Well, and that's exactly my point. You just stated it there. The precious metals have been going down. Uh, actually, they hit a bottom in December of 2015, but they're only up minorly since then. And the stock market has gone up tremendously since then. So just looking at that at that in the last couple of years, you'd say, well, investing in silver and gold is crazy. Let's go for the stock market. But here's my caution. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you don't want to put money in the stock market. I'm trying to say that if you evaluate things on a risk and reward basis, you can see a little bit of possible reward in the stock market. It's very high right now by any number of measures, fundamental, ratios, technical. Um, it's very high. It's very overbought. Not to say that it can't go higher. I mean, Amazon at 1,000 can still go to Amazon at 2,000, which it did. But it doesn't mean that the overall stock market isn't at risk of a major correction. And when the risk is high and the reward is low, it seems to me like that's not the first place you should be looking to put your money. On the other side of that, if you look at silver, again, with an 85 ratio between gold and silver, which is historically always marked either at, at, or very near a low, um, the risk is immensely, is very low. There's very little risk in silver right now, and there's quite a large potential in silver rising. Silver can go crazy for months or even a couple of years at a time, and then collapse for seven or eight years at a time, and that's where we're at right now. People forget that because they don't see the big picture. They don't realize that in the big picture, silver is a tremendous buy right now. Now, does that mean it can't go down another 30 cents? Certainly not. Does it mean that it's more likely to go up $3 and down 30 cents? Probably. But we don't know that for sure yet. But if the risk is very low on silver, the risk in the stock market is high, the reward in the stock market is low, the reward in the, the potential reward in silver is high. So it seems to me that one would want to look away from the stock market, away from the bond market, and toward the metals at this point. Now, how do you see the um, rate hikes coming from the Fed? We just saw one last week, um, and you know they said that there, you know, probably more um, people are expecting that there will be more coming uh, next year. How do you think this will impact the markets? I think it's going to put pressure on the stock market. I think it's going to uh, boost the. Uh, interest rates, of course, on both the short and the long term. And anytime you have um, the interest rates rising in the, in the bonds, then you have them as a competitor for dollars. And uh, those dollars then have a choice of going into metals, which nobody cares about, or they can go into the stock market. And you say, well, darn, the risk is high on that, and I can get so many percent on my money over here in the bond market. It just shifts the, the weighting slightly in your thinking to go more toward uh, the bond market, more toward short-term safe stuff, and less in the stock market. The other thing that is a factor in that is, what about geopolitical risk? What about um, uh, war risk? Anytime people are worried about, well, what's the government going to do? What's the Federal Reserve going to do? Uh, what's the next crazy politician going to do? Uh, what's going to happen in the Middle East? When people worry about those things, and right now the, the worry level seems to be fairly low, um, when people worry about that, they say, well, maybe I want my money in something safer 
like short-term T-notes and so forth, and less in the risky things like the stock market. That's a factor too. Hard to evaluate that. But, you know, I think that one, the, the one thing we haven't talked about here that I think is monumentally important, and it affects the stock market, the bond market, the silver market, and the gold market, is central bank intervention. Um, there have been a lot of, of discussions about how the Swiss central bank uh, creates um, Swiss francs uh, by the trillions, and then they turn around and convert those to dollars, and they use those dollars to buy uh, primarily the FANG stocks in the United States, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon, and so forth. And, you know, if you think about it, that's quite a deal. You take a computer, you press a couple of keys, you create a whole bunch of Swiss francs, and then pretty soon you've got real, real stocks that people think have value. Then you can sell the real stocks and buy something real like, you know, Swiss chalets or houses or gold or whatever. Um, you've created wealth from nothing by virtue of being a central bank. Well, the Swiss central bank is creating a massive amount of wealth. They're one of the largest Apple stockholders now in existence. The Japanese uh, central bank has done the same thing with their stocks, their ETFs, and a number of others uh, that have done that. The, the U.S. Federal Reserve, so far as we know, hasn't bought stocks, but they've bought several trillion dollars worth of bonds. They're manipulating the markets. And... As long as they can create dollars, yen, euros, whatever, and the, yeah, the European Central Bank has been creating a lot, has been buying bonds. Uh, as long as they can create currencies at a relatively at zero cost, and then use that to selectively buy things, they can support those markets. A great deal of the support, in my opinion, and the opinion of others, for the stock market, um, the U.S. stock market, has been the actions of central banks. And so that affects, you know, if you putting your money in the central end of the stock market because central banks are doing it, um, who wants to fight the central banks? They're going to keep boosting and boosting and boosting it until they can't. There will come a point where they, they can't push it any farther. But right now, in fact, the market's up today. Um, and much of that is optimism and buying on the basis of extra liquidity fed into those stock and bond markets. Um, it can't last forever, but trying to pick a, a term date is difficult. But I think that's something that is that is easily mis missed, is the central bank's in, uh, intrusion into the markets and their support for the stock and bond markets. And you know that they're buying a certain amount of gold, but they're certainly not supporting those markets. Um, but they are buying gold. And at some point, they may choose to put much more support into the gold markets and take it out of the stock market. But then the question you have to ask is, who buys all the stocks that the central banks are selling? Do you De follow me on all that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so yeah, if the Swiss is buying these stocks and essentially, um, you know, creating a demand for a lot of these stocks in the United States, yeah, what does happen when they want to sell? Well... Good question. You know, hopefully they never want to sell. But the problem is that, in effect, what's happening is the central banks create money and then they buy technology or they buy the buy the economy, buy the stock market with the created money. This is one of the problems with being able to create money from nothing. Now, if you know, if you've got billions of dollars of of created money in Apple stock, it's just as good as far as the stock market is concerned, and the billions of dollars from 401ks. That levitates the market. Now, when somebody wants to sell, like say the Swiss Central Bank needs to move that money to something else, or they get a feeling that um, that it's time to, to exit, um, then they have to put those stocks on the market. They've had all this enhanced um, levitated demand that they've created by buying the stocks where's the you know the compensating demand going to come from come from to buy those stocks from the Swiss central bank when they want to liquidate the point of this is and this is the worrisome thing which I don't know how to evaluate but what it says is that at some point the central banks through say the you know the Bureau of International Settlements may choose to say well it's We've milked this thing about as far as we can. Maybe it's time to crash the market and then let things fall, and then in a couple of years pick up the pieces at pennies on the dollar. And if they have all those stocks that they bought with with created money, they're in a position to do that. In fact, um, there's an article that uh, Ellen Brown wrote, and you know she's a, a pretty astute banker attorney type. She says. 
the central bank U.S. and global holdings are so large that their withdrawal from the market could trigger another global recession. That means when and how the economy will collapse is now in the hands of central bankers. I don't know if that's a totally accurate statement, but it makes sense to me. And it's worrisome because it shows the power of, of created money to levitate and then possibly crash markets. Because as we all know, markets don't go up forever. I wanted to move our focus to uh, another topic that uh, you've been discussing recently on your website, which is the universal basic income. Now, this is an idea that um, a lot of countries have been thinking over. Essentially, um, if you can maybe explain it a bit more in detail, but some countries have even been testing it. Like, what is your perspective on this? And you're saying that this actually, in a subtle way, kind of exists already in the United States. Well, yes, I'm saying that. And there's a a certain amount of, of resistance to that opinion. I express the opinion, um, and it's it's a, it, it isn't. A, not everyone's going to agree with it. But the UBI, the basic idea of the UBI is, we will fund you with a certain amount of money per month, and you don't have to do anything for it. How's that different from food stamps, or how's that different from welfare? Or, as another example, if we put out $800 billion to a trillion dollars a year in the U.S. Uh, for the military-industrial complex and the whole Defense Department and the Pentagon, uh, we're doing the same thing with a whole bunch of defense contractors. It's just uh, government money supporting um, individuals, corporations, businesses, whole groups of – whole. Uh, groups of, of corporations, um, we're doing that kind of as an automatic way of doing business. The specific UBI, to get back to the detail, is the basic idea of the UBI is that we, get, we the government, will give a certain amount of money to individuals, and they can use that however they want. And it's to, you know, the, there's the... Um, one of the proposals was to give a bunch of people money because their jobs will go away because of robotics. Well, you know, that's just a way of saying perpetual unemployment compensation. Um, there's another concern that uh, the welfare rolls will grow so much larger because we don't have jobs for people, and so we have to give them money to live, and so we want to give them uh, UBI, universal basic income, for doing nothing. Or another suggestion is we give her a UBI and we take away some of the other social safety net things, the welfare and other things, and just make everybody have a UBI, and that makes it simpler and easier to administer, fewer problems, less fraud. You know, who knows? The real question that I don't hear anybody answering is, who pays for it? Now, one suggestion was tax the wealthy, of course. You know, that's the universal answer is always tax the rich, tax the wealthy, and let them pay for it. And, uh, you know, that doesn't really work very well. Uh, certainly not popular with the wealthy. Um, and so... I don't think that anybody has an answer on that. But my point with the UBI was that we're talking about it at a very limited scale. But really, the whole economy is based around a lot of government support and a lot of government uh, feeding money to different individuals and corporations. And um, you know, if you don't have money, you don't buy. If you don't have buy, you're not. A, if you don't buy, you're not a consumer. You can't buy houses. You can't buy food. You can't buy whatever. It just keeps the whole system moving and churning. Not necessarily healthy and not necessarily efficient, but it's one more way to get money in the hands of individuals to keep the system churning. In regard to UBI, there's a couple of other ways it could be done. You can either just create the money as debt. The U.S. government goes, instead of being $21.5 trillion in debt, maybe they become much more in debt because they're funding the UBI. They send checks out to everybody, or they reduce taxes or something as a means of putting more money into the hands of individuals. There's a third way that people talk about sometimes, helicopter money, and that would be, for instance, some variation of the Federal Reserve simply writes checks. It doesn't become debt. They just you know, inflate the, the currency and feed more money into the system directly that way. And, you know, when I say money, I mean Federal Reserve notes, which really aren't real money. They're debts of the Federal Reserve. But if they're debts of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve could create a whole bunch of these things and feed them into the economy. And I'm sure there'd be lots of ugly consequences, but it's one of the thoughts that, that people have discussed about the UBI. You know, my general impression of the UBI is it's a really bad idea, but um, a, ver a number of very people have suggested they consider it likely that it's coming and will be implemented. 
And what do you think the effect will the this will what do you think the effect will be of this on the economy if it is implemented? Well, it's it, I think it's almost inevitable that that will substantially increase currency in circulation, which will inevitably decrease price or decrease purchasing power of the dollar and inevitably increase prices. And you know that's the norm. I mean, the the Ford F-150 truck in 1965 cost 2,000, and now it costs 45 to 50,000. The norm is increasing prices. The norm is devalued dollars. And I think that the UBI, if it's implemented in whatever form, whether it's direct helicopter money from the Federal Reserve or whether it's increased uh, uh, increased debt by the federal by the government or whether it's reduced taxes, any combination of that will increase dollars in circulation and increase prices. And then you're back to where you are. You know, you you um, you give people more money so they can buy more stuff, but then it turns out the money doesn't buy very much stuff anymore. So there's a kind of a vicious circle in this, and I'm not sure that people see the the big picture on the consequences of that. But you can pretty well guarantee that higher prices and devalued dollars are are in the beginning stages of the consequences. And coming full circle here, you're saying that it's very likely that this could be implemented. Um, and coming full circle, like getting back to precious metals, I mean, what is your perspective on like, is this a way to prepare oneself for this kind of devaluation of the currency? Well, remember, devaluation is an ongoing process from 1913 on. And certainly, um, we have so many issues in the in the economy in the world today, UBI being one of them, massive wars being another one, uh, in, you know, in, increased socialistic, you know, demands. I mean, we have presidential candidates talking about free health care and free uh, college education and free this and free that. You know, everybody needs to buy votes. And so they're coming up with that. All of those things will devalue dollars and raise prices. And to me, the logical thing is you have to have your money invested in something that's going to protect you from those devalue dollars and rising prices. I happen to think that silver right now has that low risk, high reward potential. But if you were in 2009, you'd have to say, well, the stock market looks pretty good because they're going to levitate it with lots of cheap money and they're going to feed it into the economy and that's going to um, boost the stock market and the bond market. Well, it did. Um, it, but that's that, that was 2009. Today is today. The stock market's high. The bond market's already rolling over. And silver is, is at a multi-year low and, and um, um, by most any measure you want to look at, ready to rally. Now I don't know that ready means next week or next month, but it does mean that sometime in the in the near future we should see substantially higher prices. So that's my way of of saying simple, easy, safe way to protect your money and protect your retirement and protect your assets from declining purchasing power. All right. Well, Gary Christensen, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to remind our viewers where they can find you and any last thoughts you had? Um, of course, my last thought is uh, I see silver as a very good investment now. Um, and if you want to read my articles, uh, they're available on deviantinvestor.com and a few other places. Um, but um, read my articles if you're interested in precious metals and uh, um, a more conservative approach to the economy. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you.